Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the great privilege of trying something very different today. I welcome back to the channel Garfield Reed. I welcome Prince Charlandin and Rofe, also known as Dr. Ben. Today we're going to be having a very open discussion with opposing views on religion and the Bible and views on cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis and this is just going to be an open discussion an open dialogue back and forth so throwing it out there to everybody just jump in dr ben first of all can you just start off by just giving us a brief intro as to who you are all right all right no problem shalom everyone ekele so that's greetings in Hebrew and Igbo. Um, again, my name is uh, Rofe Ben Sedek Hamagan. Hamagan represents healer, warrior, priest. Uh, ben Sedek means one who pursue higher knowledge, entrap it, decipher, and live it. I was born in Jama, Yaka, which is a Akan name. Uh, the original word that gave birth to Jamaica and a can term, Jamaica, Jamaica. I'm a herbalist. I have an integrative system where I fuse various African healing arts into one mechanism. And um, I, so I practice under that banner. Um, I'm also a, a raw vegan chef. So herbalist, raw vegan chef, and also a Qigong practitioner. Yeah, so that much I can say. And I also uh, ancient Hebrew uh, metaphysician. Pinchalendin. Shalom Bahashim Yochwa, Hakudish Israel. Everybody worldwide know me as the mighty Hebrew. I was appointed a prince by the late International Ambassador and Prime Minister, Prince Asiel Ben Israel. I'm the founder of Hebrew Cosmic Genesis, Hebrew Anthropogenesis, Archaic Antediluvian Hebrew Symbolism, the Mighty Hebrew University, the Mighty Hebrew Israelite Saba Nationalistic Research Team, and a host of other things. Um, me and my family, we repatriated back to Africa in 2021. So we live in two locations. We live in Tanzania, East Africa, and we also live in Demona, Israel. Northeastern Africa. I was an understudy of Masik Eliashu Ben Yahuda and saw Dr. Kazrael Ben Yahuda and the late Prince Dr. Shaliha Ben Yahuda of the School of the Prophets Institute at Demona, Israel, Northeastern Africa. I got my MA, my master's in African Middle Eastern Studies from the School of the Prophets Institute. And I also have my MA in Divine Hebraic Fundamentalism under Nasik El Ram Ben Yahuda which is one of the Nasa king of the kingdom of Yah and Demona Israel, which helped me shape the mighty Hebrew university. Thank you. And last but not least, Garfield. Peace, everybody know me as Brother Garfield. Um, I'm the author of Misconceptions and Misinformation by the Black Hebrew Israelites, volume one, um, Amazon number one bestseller. And um, I'm basically a researcher. I don't have the accolades like the brothers before that I spoke before, but I'm here as a researcher and um, I'm here to basically get better understanding of where these brothers are coming from. And let's, let's agree to disagree and be disagreeable, you know, and um, in the proper way how Africans know how to do it. All right. But that's where I started. Oh, um, Brother Goffey podcast is my channel on YouTube. And you could catch me on sound at the studios at times. All right. So let's start off with Rofe. Have are you familiar with uh, Garfield's book? I have never read Garfield's book, but I've heard of it. From what you've heard, what what have you heard? Uh just just misconceptions. That's all. But I, in terms of details, nothing at all. Garfield, can you give a 30-second synopsis of your book? 
Well, pretty much the, 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 the misconceptions of the book is basically a misunderstanding that I think that's been spread throughout the world regarding Hebrews and um, being black and Israelites and being descendants and De Deuteronomy 28 and just pushing out wrong information about the biblical text. Because I don't look at the biblical text as um, just theology. There is stuff in there that you could confirm in history and through archaeology. So I think what people do is they, they pay attention more to a theological part instead of looking at the historical part. So they misunderstand the stories and try to act like the stories are referring to us in a modern day time in the West, which I think they are actually totally incorrect on. But this book actually um, is very in line with academia. And um, I do want to talk about academia too, because I've heard the charges by Prince, um, by my Hebrew, and I heard what my brother said on Sanetta. So we're going to deal with um, scholarship and how people deal with scholarship and academia and how people deal with Eurocentric lens. That's why I made sure I had these on today, because these are some Eurocentric lens. So we're going to deal with all of that today and we're going to have some fun. But my book is basically to let people look at the Bible and have a better understanding of where they're coming from. That's all. Rofe, does that clarify, give you a bit more of an insight into where Garfield is yeah. coming from? Yes, it does. So based on that, do you have any questions for Garfield on that? Uh, well, I would rather um, Garfield just uh, extract a quote from the book, like share with share an example of particular misconception, and then I can respond appropriately to that. Your mute uh, While he's doing that, is it okay if I come in and just give 30 of seconds? Of course. Um, I have read um, quite a bit of excerpts from Garfield's book. Um, I've been following Garfield since I got introduced, crazy as it is, but not crazy through my email, through my mother, her and Garfield would exchange information through Facebook. So that's how I got in contact with Garfield. Um, one of the things that I can say about Garfield Reed, Reed's book, it's well scholarly put, yes. Um, his approach method is more or less coming at the one West mainstream Israelites. So, you know, sometimes the banner of one West can overshadow the whole Hebrew Israelite body, so to say. So we're coming by the way of the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem that was founded by the late Ben Ami, the late Prince Asiel Ben Israel, and the late Prince Dr. Shaliyah Ben Yahuda. So I think this approach is gonna be very different because of the African identic background that we have in our own scholarship body, that's all. Yeah, um, pretty much what I do is I basically, don't, I don't really quote a lot of scriptures in the book. I basically look at things from a historical and archeological basis. For example, I have, a tra I have a chapter called The Lost Tribes Have Been Found. And this might be more of a universal comment regarding um, as far as the lost tribe, because most of us who claim to be African and Israelites, whether it's from Demona or so forth, they do connect somehow with being um, people being lost tribes. And what I did with that chapter is clear that notion up that it's basically a myth that's been blown out of proportion. I don't think any um, one left in the 8th century BC and ended up in the West, in the Americas. I don't think Deuteronomy 28 applies to um, the people in, um, in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, in America. I think it's, it's a flawed argument that's not based on anything factual. It's just based on faith. So if somebody wants to be a, a Israelite based on faith, that's fine. Anybody could do that. I could do that right now. But to, to go around and basically perpetrate this fraud, which I think it is, that we are, we are part of some prophecy that was written allegedly. We don't even know when it was written, who wrote it, but we're saying it applies to us. It's just a game that in 2022, nobody 
And I absolutely mean nobody shouldn't be playing with black folks at all. And, I, and my challenge is, we, I heard uh, Mighty Hebrew make this statement and he has to account for this in that Garfield, somebody had a had, had, um, screenshot one day, he made a comment about me. And he keeps going around saying, Garfield is using Eurocentric scholars. And I heard Dr. Ben Tassedek said on Sarnetta that I'm looking at stuff through the Eurocentric lens. So I made sure I had my Ray-Ban glasses so I could actually use them while I'm talking to both of you guys. And what I am saying is you guys are pushing a white man's religion with a black face. That's what I'm saying to both of you guys. And what I challenge you is show me that the sources that you use to come up with your conclusions are totally black. I don't want any white source being used and being masked with a black face. Show me that the person source you're using went out and dug up the archeology. span Show me the translations that you're using, the Hebrew came from a black man and a black mind. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna see the hypocrisy fall apart. So when somebody makes the claim, oh, you're Eurocentric in the way that you're thinking, then you're developing what's called a mind of a cultist meaning that we are against whatever the white people say, so don't listen to him. And I think our freedom, whether it's Marcus Garvey, whether it's Malcolm X, whether it's even um, Farrakhan, I mean, I'm, I'm talk you're talking about Khalid Abdul Muhammad, somebody who I stood post on in my NOI days. I'm saying that I never looked at Khalid Abdul Muhammad and said, you're following the white man's religion. So you're, whatever you're saying as pro-black is wrong. I think we've all been influenced Eurocentrically because basically we are descendants of slaves. That's all four of us are descendants of people who are part of the slave trade. That's what we have in common. The truth is everybody wants to interpret a Bible the way they want to, to try to encourage people, hey, you know what? I have the truth. So the Bible, the Bible cannot help us in 2022. It can't. There's nothing mighty Hebrew could do in Africa or in Israel. There's nothing Dr. Ben Tesedek could do in Jamaica and do and preach the Bible and say, this is gonna come, nothing is gonna come. We've been waiting so many years for things to happen and nothing is happening. And, it, and the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. There's nothing, white Eurocentric thought, white supremacy, as long as what you believe, if it can't stop white supremacy, it's irrelevant to our progress as black people. And the Bible right now, it's not doing nothing. All it's doing is creating cults and creating followers. And I stop right here. Okay, my question to you, Garfield. You said there is nothing that mighty Hebrew or myself can share with our people from a biblical perspective to stop white supremacy. Now, I ask you a question and you can answer this within, well, don't have to be extensive. What do you mean by stopping? white supremacy. White supremacy is basically, no, my, my whole thing is this. If we walk down the streets, and, and, and by the way, Mighty Hebrew is smart to move to Tanzania because he knows if he stays in America, white supremacy plays a major role here more than in Tanzania because he's around more of his quote unquote people. If any four of us right now would go to New Zealand, we would be treated as horrible as possible because of the color of our skin. We would not be treated the same way as somebody who's quote unquote white. So teaching the Bible, what is it really doing though? It can't stop white supremacy. It serves no purpose. What we're doing is, is, is trying to get black people to join a wait and see program. We are waiting just like other Christians have us waiting for 2000 years for something special to happen. And when it doesn't happen, what's gonna happen? We're all gonna die and nothing is going to happen. So you preaching the Bible or mighty Hebrew preaching it does nothing for us. Can, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. All right. Like so we're not 
Sound, okay, yeah, it did. Like but now I can hear. I can hear it too now. Okay, so here's my next. I, I'm just now. You use the term "wait and see." There is nothing that my Hebrew teaches or that I teaches coming from the Tanakh or the Torah that deals with wait and see. I'm an herbalist, and I ain't gonna tell you to wait on somebody coming out the sky or none of those concepts. I'm going to give you practical, tangible things to do to correct your issues. And I base that on the very language Hebrew. Everything about the language, the 22 letters, 22 amino acids, that's something you can prove. It's scientific. It's practical. There's no wait and see. That wait and see is what Caucasian taught us within the Hebraic or the African mindset, but Ibare, Ibere, it's practical, tangible. So I'm gonna give you one example of what I teach. Now, this brother is not coming from the Torah. He's, he doesn't go to church, he doesn't profess none of these things. His name is Dr. Sirius B. And he's well respected. He's a scientist, master musician, right? He's an herbalist too. And he made reference to 6,000 years ago, where in which he said, in Kemet, the cat was domesticated. But he said, within the cat intestine develops a virus known as toxoplasma. And the toxoplasma, when the cat defecates, the toxoplasma produce a pheromone that attract rats. Once the rat consume the toxoplasma or the excrement, the toxoplasma then makes its way to the amygdala, which sits behind the nose. The amygdala deals with flight, fight, your ability to sense danger, your um, survival imperative, sex, wants, desire. It, it communicates the desire of your, the pons and the medulla, or the, 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 the reptilian brain, your animal nature. Right? So now, once the toxoplasma infects the rat, the rat's ability to see the cat as being dangerous, or let's use the word as white supremacist, non-existence. The cat, the rat now see the cat as a friend. So Dr. Sirius B used that example to say, he used that example to say the mass of, uh, there's a, a high percentage of black people who are infected with toxoplasma and the toxoplasma caused them to exhibit schizophrenic state of existence. They can no longer see the, the system or the Caucasian as, as being a threat or they adopt certain thought pattern and behavior that they don't even see that as part of the means that is used to enslave you, right? So he used that example. What I do is this, I heard what he have to say. And because the Hebrew language is scientific, I now go into Deuteronomy 28, verse 60, because prophecy have to be correlated or substantiated by history and science. So since Deuteronomy is purported as the prophecy pertaining to what will happen to a particular melanated people, I have to now, I'm no, I'm, I have to now go in and make the correlation. So when I go in to Deuteronomy 28, verse 60, it says the plagues of Egypt will cling on to you. Now, when I look up the term plague, the word there is daba, daber, and it's related to the word daba, which means a thing, or it can mean a created thing. And cling on to you is the word dabak, also in the sense of mitosis. So when I look at that, and I look at the condition in Africa, I look at the condition of our people in Jamaica, and the high percentage of our people that are suffering with viral infection, not just toxoplasma, 
H. pylori, and a number of others that occupy their endocrine system, the limbic system and control or cause them to crave things that are adverse to cognition and healthy lifestyle or to the things that we need to engage in to free ourselves. So I'm able to now go into Deuteronomy 28 and 60 and make a correlation with that prophecy with exactly what Dr. Sirius B was breaking down. It's referring to these viral infection or these pathogenic overload that we have in our biochemistry. Because if you look around you, most places you go today, cats saturate those environments. But it's not just cats. The mere, whenever you consume a diet that is also high in sugars, you're gonna, you're gonna saturate your body with a lot of sulfur. When you consume a diet high in meat, you're gonna saturate your body with also a lot of ammonia. Ammonia and sulfur cause anaerobic condition in the biochemistry and that cause cell to mutate and that leads to pathogenic overgrowth, not just toxoplasma. And this pathogenic over, these pathogens now hijack your thoughts, your behavior, and cause you to exhibit a captive state of mind. So when you look at you melanin people from Nigeria to Jamaica, look at our plates, look at the food that we eat, saturated sugars and animal flesh. So there is a lifestyle that came about because of our degeneracy from laws that deals with nutrition that cause us now to develop these pathogens within or create the acidic condition within our biochemistry to attract even pathogens that existed externally. But it's not just that. The very system of white supremacy engage us in biological warfare. They create viruses to in, and race specific pathogens to, in, to, to infect us. And these pathogens go and control our amygdala and cause us to be trapped in what is called animalistic behavior or flight or fight response. We're always okay. in survival mode. So okay. I just wanted to make that correlation. So when you read Deuteronomy 28 verse 60, it says these plagues or these created things, the bear, the back, will cling on to you. And we witness that. We are witnessing that today. We have high case cases of lifestyle-related disease. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Let me, okay, go ahead. No, hey, no, um, go ahead. you want me to go, Mighty Hebrew? I think yeah, you gotta you put go a ahead. clock, I think you gotta put a clock yeah. on everybody, bro, because my yeah, brother ran for 12 ahead. minutes. 12 minutes and I don't want to run for 12 minutes. Yeah, I'm fair. gonna I'm gonna restrict the responses to three minutes. All right, cool. All okay. right. All uh, right, let me well, let's do let's do this. Since Dr. Bain Zadig went 12 minutes, let Garfield go until he's finished his story. Then you start with me three minutes and we keep going three minutes down the line. Great. Okay. All right, all right cool. Hey, let me let me say this first of all. And 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 I don't believe not one word Dr. Ben just said. It was a bunch of gibberish. And this is the problem. And if I try to fact check him, I'm listening to the white man. This is what's ruining our community. Everybody is a leader. They want to teach. I support you saying the diet. I do agree. Black folks need to cut out certain foods. And we need to eat better as a people. I don't need a Bible to tell me that. I'm a grown ass man. I think what you're doing is you're attaching everything to the Hebrew Bible because you are basically a part of the cultic white mind. That's the white mind you need to worry about, building cults through the Bible. You're having what's called a Jim Jones moment. You serve no purpose for humanity outside of what you teach regarding health, which I don't know about because I don't trust nothing you're saying. You just said that this crazy guy, Sirius B, is a great mind. Based off of who? Who would listen to a guy who's talking about cats in Egypt without research to back it up? 
And this is what we do on social media. We could come on and spew and try to sound intelligent. Oh, 6,000 years ago, the cat were domesticated in axoplasma and it attracts the rat and try to, uh, you're not deep, bro. It's a bunch of gibberish. And this is what I hate about what black folks do. All you need to do is put a plan together so we could overcome this struggle. In Jamaica right now, 20, 28 families control over 80% of the wealth. What are you doing to overthrow that while you're in Jamaica, hiding in a damn corner in Mandeville? What are you doing to the top of white supremacy in Jamaica? Our people are bleaching their skin to be white because they hate being black. That's a bigger problem than reading Deuteronomy 28. And Deuteronomy 28, sir, is not even a prophecy. It's not, even, this is the lie that you are going around teaching our people, bro, and talking about how Deuteronomy 28 is a prophecy. It is not a prophecy. It's basically a condition. This is what allegedly Moses wrote it. He's basically telling us, if you don't follow this, this is going to happen to you. So you're telling me for over 3,000 years, Black people who are Israelites have been living under curses and you want us in 2022 to follow that garbage? That's crazy. Now, Deuteronomy 28, no matter what it says though, a lot of it has to do with actually people living in the land. If you're not aware, I could pull up the scriptures myself and read it. But the issue here is I never once said that systematic white supremacy or white supremacy is not a problem. But you basically said that. But you reading Hebrew can't save us. Well, so if the police stop me down the black esoteric, you're going to tell, you tell him, hey, I know Deuteronomy 28, bro. Don't beat me. Don't kill me. Because I know Deuteronomy 28. He's going to beat you in the head. That's why I gave the, 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 um, the example of us all going to New Zealand because we have the same shade. Our skin color is pretty much the same. We're going to be mistreated based off the color of our skin. But what you're leaving out, buddy, is that all of this traces back to your filthy book you call the Bible. If that Noah story with Ham wasn't misinterpreted by Eastern Christians, by Jews in the Talmud or whatever they're writing in, talking about we are cursed with our noses, big and thick lips, and we are cursed dark, and we have big long donkey dicks and, and all this craziness. If the Arabs never used that book and said that we are Kush. All black people in Africa is Kush. The Trans-Saharan slave trade possibly would not happen. That's over 20 to 30 million people. Now, when the Portuguese saw black people in West Africa, they said, hey, look, the Muslims call them Kush and they're cursed. So they thought that enslaving black people was the right thing to do based off of that filthy book you're trying to let black people follow. So don't tell me about no Hebrew. I don't need to read no Hebrew because it can't save me when I'm on the street. It can't pay my bills. It can't do nothing for me. If we're going to have a united front as black people, we need to come up with a plan that defeats and overthrow white supremacy fully. That's what we need. We don't need no gibberish. And that's all I'm hearing. Serious B this. I don't know. How do I fact check serious B? And now you're giving out medical and information, who is fact-checking what you're saying? I don't believe you. I don't trust it. Not because it's from a black man, I should just take it. I want to go to a lab with, with a physician or a researcher and research everything that you're saying because I don't believe you. I don't trust you. Anybody that's trying to push Deuteronomy 28 and the Bible to us is no good for black people. I'm telling you that straight up. I don't care who it is. It could be my father. It ain't no good for black people. And this is the, this is the problem. I'm looking at it from a black man lens who lives in America, who could be stopped any day on the street corners for, for just walking around being a dark skinned guy. That can't save nothing for black people. I don't care. That's why, that's why my Hebrew moved to Africa. You know what time it is in America? Because you walking around today dealing with these cops and this system is totally against us. So you're telling me I got to read a scripture to the police when he pulled me over? This is nuts. But I'm going to stop right here. Um, a brief intermission, not to run the show, because both of y'all said some real um, interesting factors, and I want to um, chime in, but first, since it's um, Esoteric Thought Show, um, would you like to say anything before I make uh, bring forth my brief commentary? No, continue the flow. Go for it, Prince Charlene. 
of God. Um, bring the fourth order, giving all praise and honor to your court and the soul, the supreme, intelligent, powerful one of our forefathers, Abraham, his company, I quote. Um, since we're running with a three minute thing, <clears throat> I don't want this to be a debate because, like, you know, we talked earlier, we want everybody to get the bird's eye view. But the late Ben Ami says something very imperative. He said, truth has the inherited power to produce the promise effect. So I always heard him say that. And when you look at those such as the late Prince Asiel ben Israel, and you see this is just one man in our community that has established things we've been waiting for. Now I might say, why are you bringing this up, Prince Charlene Dean, the mighty Eber? Because one of the comments that Brother Garfield Reed was saying was about the concept of a wishful thinking of hope, so to say, of waiting. We're Hebrew Israelite sovereign nationals. We understand that we are God, okay? So having that understanding, we wait for nothing. Our whole understanding of what is defined in Tanakh is either based on two fundamental factors, Hebrew cosmogenesis or Hebrew anthropogenesis. So to really have a dialogue with us, you have to understand the thought process that we're coming. Now, I understand you've dealt with um, many people that have the wishful thinking based on a religiosity of coming into Hebrew thought. Where are we at, good brother? I wanna read two scholars. I wanna read something from Dr. Yosef A.A. Ben Yokenaya. Can you say it for me? Because I can't see it. Because your esoteric thought. One minute is. left. One minute left. Okay. I wanna read something from Dr. Yosef A.A. Ben Yokenaya in his book, African Origins of the major Western religions. Because the understanding that we're coming from is from respected Afrocentric scholars and even scholars amongst our peers of the Hebraic presence in Africa. Now, remind the listening audience, we're not them Hebrews that believe that all the slaves that came on the slave ships were Hebrews. There were other indigenous tribes that were not Hebrews that were also on them sleep ships. So let me just read this to you real fast and then I'm gonna stop it and pass it to Bains today. I just wanna read the quotation and that's it. I know I might be just a little over time. It says, in North Africa, just before the period of Christianity's legal entry into Rome, due to Constantine the Great's conversion in the fourth century, there were many Hebrew tribes that were of indigenous, African, the so-called Negroes, origin. The, it says, these African Jews, as all other Romanized Af Africans of this era, were caught in a rebellion in Serene during 115 CE against Rome, Roman imperialism and colonialism. This rebellion also marked the beginning of a mass Jewish meaning Israelite, Hebrew, migration southward into Sudan or West Africa, along the way of the city of Air and into the countries of Futa Jalan and Senegal or Senegambia, which lie below the Pelabellic curve of the Niger River's most northern reaches, where the city of Timbuktu, Mali, presently stands. These Jews were driven or excuse me, were divided into two main groups and took separate directions further southward into West and Central West Africa. One group joined the Fulanis of Futa Jalan, from whom the present population of indigenous Africans of Borni and Kamen in Nigeria inherit their Hebrew traditions. This indigenous African Jewish penetration from North Africa into Sudan, West Africa, 
even reached the borders of Lake Chad in Central Africa. So I want to stop there. So we have Dr. Yosef A.A. Ben Yokanayan, the re a respected Afrocentric scholar worldwide in the Black communities, letting us know that there was indigenous African Hebrews that migrated from Northeastern Africa, miscalled the Middle East, into West Africa and amalgamated with the indigenous population of that area. Having that in retrospect and understanding, it is clear that it is possible that there were tribes in West Africa that had Hebrew blood in their veins and even a amalgamation of Hebrews with these indigenous tribes that went into the transatlantic slave. <laughs> Excuse me. So I just transatlantic slave trade. So I just wanted to put some historical value because we're all quoting. Well, I'm the one that actually really quoted something first. So I'm laying the foundation. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to let them two dialogue. But every time it's my turn, I'm going to bring a historical reference from an Afrocentric scholar verifying what we're saying. So as he's breaking down what he's breaking down, I'm going to break down the historical chronology that there are Hebrews in West Africa. There are keep how not how much, time, how much time he used, bro. How much time okay. did he use people? That's six I'm minutes. Done. So because there's two I'm of done. you, I'm because, done. I'm done my, because there's two of you, yes, after I'm each of you, Garfield, Garfield will jump in after each of you speak. So Garfield, over to you. It went Bain's a date All right. Let me let me share my screen real quick and let me just deal with this real quickly. And by the way, to Dr. Ben, you're, you're misusing Dr. Ben very wisely. And because he's black, I must accept Dr. Ben 100%. And I'm going to show you something. 70 AD and 1 million Jews in West Africa. I want everybody to look on the screen. And I want the same six minutes that he got. All right? Now, this is what Roman Empire looked like. This is Mauritania, which is now Morocco, Namibia. Africa, which is Tunisia, Cyrenica, Egypt, and parts of Sudan. This is where the Roman Empire control, all the way up to where Germany is, Greece, whatever, right? Now, this is from the only person who lived in the time period of 70 AD and was a historian was actually Josephus. There was no other historian alive at the time that documented this, who lived during the time of the war. So as far as a primary source, he's the best guy for the job. He talks about how many people were actually taken. He actually said, look how many people died. The whole siege was 1,100,000, which is 1.1 million. This is where this whole 1 million thing starts from. 97,000 were taken to Cyrene. This is Roman province of Judea because it included Idumea at the time, and it included all the way up to Galilee. So it wasn't the ancient Judah that we know about in the Bible. Judea was somewhere much larger, Roman Judea. Now, this is the source, the Jewish revolts against Rome, AD 68, 135. And this is my white lens, James J. Bloom. He's the author, the scholar. Talks about Masada. They committed a suicide in 73 AD. The Jews the, um, rather kill themselves than be slaves to the Romans, right? Now, they committed suicide. I'm not even going to read everything here. Y'all could screenshot this when it's um, shown and everything. All right? But the issue now is the Sicarii who committed suicide, they went to Cyrene where these 97,000 were. Remember the 97,000 right here? They went to Cyrene and the people, the Jews, snitched on them. Because why did they snitch on them? Because they wanted to do another revolt right after the 70 AD war. So Jews, whether they were black or white, I don't care. I'm going to use the term Jews for the record because they are Judeans. Now, let's look at how difficult it is to go across the Sahara Desert. This is the Sahara Desert. And for those who don't know, over 18,000 people in the last six years have been missing or killed in the Sahara Desert. This right here is one of the most difficult places to cross. Human beings today who have cars and equipment can't even do it. 
So how did these Africans go into whatever and do what? You know what happened, brothers and sisters? Let me scroll down a little bit. And let me get to, hold on one second here. Let me get to this thing right here. Where is it at? Oh, man. Oh, here it is right here. Let me get to it right here. This is the five Roman expeditions into Africa, where they went to near Lake Chad twice. They went to near Niger. They went to near Senegal. This is the trade routes that they're developing. Because remember, the camel was not domesticated at the time. So a large amount of people could not have gone anywhere without being a part of the trade routes and the camels because they would have died. So again, if we want to say our people went into Africa and during the Kittos War, by the way, for the, those who don't know this, and I don't think the brother mighty Hebrew knows this, the Jews were killing the Romans and they were eating them. They were cannibals. They would take off their skins and make belts. They killed a lot of the Romans. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here's right here. And all consequently, 220,000 perish. In Egypt also, they performed many similar deeds. Look at this. They would cook their flesh, make bell for themselves of their entrails, anoint themselves with their blood, and wear their skins for clothing. Many they sawed in two from the head downwards. Others they would give to wild beasts and force still others to fight as gladiators. Yes, it is a white source, but actually, this is a primary account of what happened. Who else are you going to get it from? They're reporting what the Jews was beating their ass. So what do you want to say it's a white source or not? I don't care. I'm just reporting the history. Cyrene was wiped out of Jews. So the Jews, the 97,000, remember the 97,000 esoteric that Joseph has talked about? They had to leave Cyrene. So which Israelites actually went into the interior of Africa? They couldn't have because they were wiped out. So now you're saying, Dr. Ben says, I want you to provide a source because my source is right here. This white guy named um, Apulius and Antony in the Roman historical essays, that's one of the sources. And here's another white guy for you, because I like the white lens, James J. Bloom. He's a historian on the Jewish revolts. So now, how much time I got left? One minute. And now, so that, so that now starts the whole thing. So they were, Syrian Jews were exiled. After the war ended, laws were placed ordering the exile of Jews from Cyrene reduce the Jewish community of Cyrene to insignificance and set it on the road to inevitably decline. This, this shows that how, who, went into, who went into Africa at the time? Unless you had an expedition like the Romans. The Romans had their expedition. They had five. They had the money. They had the resources. And you know why they were going into Africa? Because they wanted slaves. Because remember the earliest Ghana, you're talking about Wagadu. Wagadu used to trade with the Europeans and with, with Africans because they wanted the gold and they took also our own African slaves into Europe. The Jews were there financing the Trans-Saharan slave trade. So hence, where is this people going into Timbuktu? I'm not saying Jews didn't go to Timbuktu. I'm going to get to that the next time I speak because that's easily break down. And guess what? Those people are described as white people sleeping with black African women. We have sources for that. And that's how you get what? Come on, I, I'll take you to class on this stuff, man. Come on, that's easy. I'm not saying Dr. Ben is wrong. I'm just adding on to what the elder said with new information that we have now. I'm not saying that, don't come back here and say, do you think Dr. Ben? No, Jews did go to Timbuktu. They have the Bambara Jews. And those people are documented. They were dark-skinned. But you also have Jews who came in from Europe who are light-skinned, and you had Jews, the first white Jews in Africa went to Taut, which is in Northwest Algeria. They built synagogues and temples. So on the route to Timbuktu, who were the merchants? It wasn't us because they called the Jews in Taut the Rothschilds of their day. So don't tell me, now show me before we go. I want my Hebrew to show me anyone coming off the slave ship in Jamaica, for my Jamaican brother, and for him to show me any slave coming off the ship saying, hey, I'm a Hebrew or an, I'm an Israelite, and I'm done. In, in response to, to what Garfield just, I mean, not what he shared, his first so-called rebuttal to what I offered, right. right? The first thing he said, he never responded to the information I presented. He just classified right. everything wow. as garbage. 
No, right. A true, a true scholar, a true researcher, a true scientist will never do that. Secondly, you labor Dr. Sirius B as crazy. You don't know the brother. You don't know his body of work. You don't know the, the, the fruits of his mastery as an herbalist and the results he have gotten within the black community. He's featured a lot on Black Magic um, YouTube channel and well-respected, he get results. I would never come out and just utter certain words against certain individuals who get certain results. You have not addressed anything that he presented. If you wanted facts, information relative to toxoplasm, he's not speculating, he's a scientist. He goes to the lab, he investigate these things, he said it and he give you references to authenticate this. Now, I'm gonna stick to my point. Reference to prophecy, science and history. All I am looking at is the behavior of a people and how that is, is tied to their diet. Not just diet, diet is also your environment. Diet is also the fact that you're living in a, a white supremacist system that is targeting us with biological warfare, by the way, of pathogens. We know that, we saw that with COVID, right? So the only reason I'm mentioning Deuteronomy 28 verse 60 because there's a prophecy pertaining to a people who will succumb to certain created man-made plagues that will cling to them, multiply with them by way of mitosis. That's what that word Dabak is saying. So if I, I point that out to our people and say, yo, there is such a prophecy, but that can be authenticated with history and, and science. Check out what Dr. Sirius B have to say on this subject, but he's not the only one. You have European scientists who's highlighting these things as well. Now, let me give you a quote. Uh, you can look this up, it's uh, CNN, July 26, 2018. Caption read, cat poo could reduce your fears. Now, I'm gonna, going to uh, quote a few things out of here. A time, new study. Time. Is it time? You know? Time. Time. Okay, well, in closing, cat poo could reduce your fears. You can check out that article. And that's from CNN. And they're quoting a number of experts in the field. So that's not speculative information. That's it. Garfield? Absolutely. You know, um, you know what? Uh, my turn. No, but, what are you doing? You're oh, taking over the show, bro. You're taking over the show. Now, let me say this. Let me say this to um the brother real quickly here. Dr. Sirius B is a crunk. If he's on Black Magic Channel, I love Rich, but he's crazy. That that's pseudo stuff. And and for you to reference the Black Magic Channel, that alone should tell the audience. He's a crazy dude that puts information out. Now you're talking about CNN. Now the white man, are you using your Eurocentric lens by referring to CNN? Why you tell me about CNN? That's the European. Why are you now running to the European? <laughs> and, and you tell me, I uh, saw that and you say, golf, you got a Eurocentric lens. Who is this guy? Now this is the point I'm trying to make. I don't trust nothing that you're saying unless I could review it and study it myself. That's what I said. I don't know Sirius B, but if you're saying if his claim to fame is on black magic, that alone should tell me, run for the hills. I'm not trusting nothing on there, nothing against Rich. I love him. I love Rich. I love his channel. But you know, most of the stuff on there is pseudo and it's pseudo science. So for you to refer to him tells me about you. You are a pseudo. You're pushing pseudoism. And then you're pushing Deuteronomy 28, a book you don't know who wrote it, when it was written, then you're telling us it's prophecy. It's not prophecy. So you don't even know what you're talking about. You might as well leave the Bible out of this, bro, because it can't do nothing. What's the magic wand in the Bible that's going to save black people? It can't do nothing. Me and you could right now write a book and tell people, hey, this is the best. Cut out these fools. We could agree on this. We could agree on diet. But now you're saying that the, the government is making pathogens, but you on the white man's, um, what's this, on Zoom or you, YouTube recording? So the white man now has access to you. 
He knows where you're at. It's fine. So why are you worried about the white man then? Why are you so concerned? If you he, he's, he's going to have your page all over YouTube, bro. We know who you are. So if you're such a threat with your information, you would even show your face. But the problem is, it's a big sham that people continue to do continuously. I have this special knowledge. I have Deuteronomy. You're not conning me, bro. And I'm going to tell you this right now. You're pushing falsehood. I don't care what you say. The only good advice you have is that Black people need to have a better diet because of obesity. We have the heart disease, which is the number one killer of Black people, diabetes, and all those. So that we can agree on. We need to check our diets. But as far as your information, it's pseudoscience at its highest. There's nothing you have said is factual. Why are you trying to connect us to a book that we have no connection to? You are not connected to Israel. And I'm going to prove it when the next time I speak. You can't prove you're Israel. You can't prove that. And you could try to mix up Asante and Ashan and all this craziness. But you can't prove, you can't prove that. You are an African and that's it. Hebrew is because that's your religion and faith. You're trying to perpetrate this fraud, just like the other brother on the panel. It's not real, period. I'm done, bro. Giving all praise and honor to Yahweh. One of the things, now let's get into the psychology of your mind, um, Garfield. Since you've been up here, you haven't showed us once any Afrocentric scholars at all. Now we don't have a problem with European scholars as long as things are being put in the proper context. One of the things that you did was you thought that you can show elaborate maps as if you was denying the fact or the maps and the information that you brought was denying us coming into Africa. It never even said with the sources that you used, it never even said that they migrated anywhere. That's number one. Um, I'm in this book called The African Edenic Heritage, exploring the African presence in the promised land excerpts and commentary from the African Edenic Heritage Museum by Sar Dr. Amadiel ben Yahuda, right? So I want to quote a couple of sources and references to eyewitnesses. But before I introduce that, I want to read something to y'all about the founder of the School of the Prophets. To Prince Dr. Shalia ben Yahuda, Chancellor in charge of the affairs of the African Hebrew Israelites, whose knowledge of these matters is, un, is unbeatable, and whose ability to create others in his image, adoring into Prince Asiel of Israel, international ambassador of the African Hebrew Israelites and great redeemer angel, whose voice I was blessed to hear in 1977. Let's stop there and get straight to the sources, right? Because my objective is, using all African Edenic sources. You remember I said that? That's how I would do it earlier. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So I am in, um, first I want to read Dr. John Hammond Clark real quick. In the Arab conquest of Egypt in the last 30 years of the Roman dominion, Dr. John Henry Clark says, Roman exploitation, taxation, and ruthlessness caused a lot of the original Africans in North Africa to move further into the body of Africa. The question is often asked, what happened to North Africa's black population? This is part of the answer. Then you go into another book written by him called Notes for an African World Revolution, Africans at the Crossroads, page 276. Dr. John Henry Clark says, there is a need now to study the migration of the Jews after 70 AD when the Romans destroyed their temples and started the dispersal of the Jews of that day. Where indeed did they go? There is some evidence that some of them migrated south into the body of Africa. Also, let's go real fast to shake unto Dia. Let's go to the book Pre-Colonial Black Africa. On page 233, he says, according to Tariq El Fatah, which was an eyewitness in Timbuktu, which was, which was written in 1652, an Israelite minority also lived in the bent of the Nidra region in Todarma, had made a speciality in cultivating vegetables watered with fresh well water instead of river water. And I want to close out with this. Notice thus far, everybody I'm quoting is the top-notch Afrocentric scholars that all agree Dr. Ben said, because you said, Garfield, you don't disagree with Dr. Ben. He said in his thesis 
that these people from Northern Africa, these Israelites were indigenous African people. I also showed you Dr. John Henry Clark, who clearly said that there were Israelites that went into the body of Africa. I also you Sheikh Anti Diop, where he went to Tariq El Fatah, which was an eyewitness that seen Israelites, black like us, living in the Niger bent. You keep saying you don't believe in none of this. But the thing that Dr. Bainsey Date said, you haven't showed to the listening audience that the people that he's quoting is inaccurate. You said you don't believe nothing he said because you haven't researched it. The funny thing is, did you go to the laboratories of what Europeans said? You see, and I'm not trying to make it a white black issue, but the way you're presenting your yeah, evidence, everything fine, black. Bro, come on, man. Fine, 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 don't worry, Garfield. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you additional time, time Garfield, to respond. Time? Okay, give me the same time. You can expand this time. I don't have a problem with that. My, I don't have a problem with how long he talked, actually. Okay. All right. Let me respond to him real quickly. All right. Tell me when you. That's a when, good book. Tell me when to start. Whenever you're ready, Garfield. That's a good book, by the way. Okay. Okay. Right, you can start. Second. Hold on. Hold on one second. Let me. Hold on one second. Don't start yet. Don't start yet. Don't start yet. I'm sorry, Garfield. I didn't have a PowerPoint. I didn't know we was bringing PowerPoints. No, don't we worry about it, bro. Don't worry about okay. it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I just wanted to, you made a point and I wanted to get to something. That's why. All right. Okay. okay. All right. This is the Black Jews. He said it's a great book. It's by Edith Gruda, who got her PhD on the Tudor Parfit. It's a white woman. She's from Europe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. On the Algerian border, remember he said he likes this book. It's a good book, right? On the Algerian-Moroccan border, according to a local chronicle discovered at the beginning of the 20th century by the French A.G.P. Martin, the very earliest Jewish inhabitants of Taut and Goraro settled in the first century A.D., coming from Cyrenica. So it seems like from Cyrene, they went to Algeria, Morocco's border, and were followed by a second wave of settlers who arrived with Arab traders from Mosul. Um, they were mentioned as far back as the 5th century BC in Herodotus. Another tradition from the region of Togart, which is Taut, in the northeast of Taut, reveals that the Jewish population is so ancient that they are considered the earliest white inhabitants of the area. In the most ancient period, whose tradition was conserved by memory, the country was inhabited by Jews who employed Negro workers who, and who owned cassars and palm groves. So this is distinction. This it's showing a distinction. They employed Negro workers, the first white Jews. He acknowledged that the Bible, the book is a good book. I didn't have to do that. Now he said I don't bring up black scholars, right? I could bring up black scholars. Who is this guy? The amazing facts and revelation of by Professor O. Alazi. But look at what happens when you use black sources. He's using a Photoshop stuff by African American Israelites who put fine hebos and it's actually this is the original which is actually the primary is in the library of congress and this is actually the one in his book on the left hand side this is how mm -hmm. pseudo this professor in africa is who is respected by everybody as a scholar so just because mm -hmm. of the color of his skin don't interrupt don't interrupt mighty hebrew mute your mic bro mute your mic mighty mm -hmm. hebrew mute his mic bro yeah so now um, as far as black scholars. So I, I have no problem using black scholars. I don't mind. I have, I have sources in here from African religion. I have all of this stuff. I have here black scholars again. It don't matter what the color of the person's skin is, bro. It don't matter what their DNA is. So let me just say this to you carefully. I never said I disagree with Dr. Ben. I said I'm, I, I'm adding on to what Dr. Ben said. Now, let me ask you this. If you're a real researcher, which I know you're not, you would look at what Dr. Ben's sources are. And that's what's gonna kill your argument because his sources not gonna add up to what you're saying. I'm aware of Dr. Ben's books. I've read his books. And what happened is when he talks about leaving from Cyrene and from Africa, Garfield is not saying that. Well, you just saw Edith Bruder's book, right? Esoteric, he said it's a good book. But in that book, it's saying the first, in the first century, they were white inhabitants. So that means the Jews coming from Cyrene was white color. They were white. So that kills your whole argument. What are you talking about? And those, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, during the Trans-Saharan slave trade, the Jews were the ones who were financing it. I do have those records. 
And when the Arabs said that they were Jews and they were dark skinned, that's fine. I have no problem. That don't mean all the Jews are dark skinned because guess what? They are writing about how they sleep with African women because they want to be in league when they're trading us and enslaving us. So you got to make a choice. Are you the Jews in West Africa? Because those Jews live separately and they partake in the slave trade. So if you want to claim the people that actually enslaved you, you could go ahead. I'll bring those sources up right now. Because I have those sources on this, on this slide. So if you want to go there, mighty Hebrew, you could go there. We could go there all day. I am saying you can't prove, and watch this. Watch this esoteric. Watch this challenge, and I get, bet you they don't answer. 700 AD, show me the West African Israelites. Show me the Israelites in West Africa at 700 AD. Show me them. Show me them, and show me them. Show me the, show me the, the, um, the primary sources of them in West Africa. I bet you they don't show me. Show me a slave coming off a slave ship saying, hey, I'm Hebrew or I'm Israelite or whatever. Time. I'm good. See, I respect time. See that? Thank you, Garfield. That was that was good. Excellent. Okay. Go ahead, Ben. It's a date. All right. Going back to Garfield. Earlier, you said... Um, you made mention of the fact that, again, you don't believe anything that Sirius B have to say. And, and you have to go and do your own research. Now, you're gonna do your own research based upon, and this is a question, on whose information? Whose information you're gonna to use to substantiate what Dr. Sirius B is saying? It's a question. Just answer and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna continue what I'm saying. No, go ahead, go ahead, continue. No, no, I want him to respond. No, no, I respond after. You respond. Secondly, whose information you're going to use to substantiate this, right? Now, the other thing is, you're saying that I'm using a reference from Caucasian. Now, I told you, I am a practitioner. And I see it may not specifically be toxoplasma, but I can also look at the symptoms of certain behavior that my clients exhibit to know, okay, which particular pathogen is exhibiting this. So I'm speaking, I'm having firsthand account. This is not speculative information with certain situations, right? That's one. Now, toxoplasma is mainstream. So for me to reveal, this has already been revealed. So even if I quote them, not everything they're going, they, they are going to tell you that is, is deceptive, but there's ways and means to verify what they're saying. So the same way you quoting them, you're saying, I can't quote. When I say the, the Caucasian mindset, I know specifically what I'm referring to. All right. Secondly, I wanted to ask you, when you talk about black freedom, you can't free a people if they have an issue with PTSD if you haven't divide, devised a means to address this PTSD. Now, when a person have yeast infection, there's certain behavioral pattern that comes with that. There's a lot of anger, issues with self-worth. You can't free a people if you don't know how to address that. So to just cast what I say about diet, like it's minute, it's not minute. It's one of the most critical area. I'm leaving the history to, to my the Hebrew, to Nasi. But when it comes to psychology and bio, biochemistry, I'm sticking to that point. You can't address these things. You can't free a people if you don't know how to address their biochemistry. And when we, so when you go into the book of Numbers and Leviticus and you begin to look at some of the law that Moshe brought forth, you realize Moshe was dealing with the biochemistry, the PTSD. We can go into that next round, but you have to address these issues, the parasitic infections, what is causing it, the PTSD, because they out alter the thought pattern yeah. of the people and prevent them from discerning what's right from what's wrong. So you can't put together, you can't just throw a plan together for liberation without addressing <laughs> The biochemistry, the psychology. Perfect. All right, set the clock. I'm ready. 
All right. Um, let me just respond to what you're saying. Again, you're just basically ranting out of emotion. And since you deal with psychology, obviously you are emotional at this time. And I'm diagnosing you because I'm going I'm to be a fake doctor too today and say I'm Dr. Garfield and I'm going to diagnose you. That is got total, again, total garbage. Now you're saying, how am I going to verify it? So you're saying that you're going to come to my Black people that I love. And you're going to say that you could come and teach us anything you want, bro. Come on, bro. And we shouldn't fact check you. You got the cure. You got the cure for cancer, don't you? Don't you got the cure for diabetes, don't you? We shouldn't fact check you, bro. How stupid do you think black people are? How stupid? That's why I wore these Ray-Ban white glasses. Because I got to look through, through the European lens. I got to look at you through these European lens you and I saw that and talked about. So I want to look at you right now and say, bro, stop fooling black people, bro. Stop it. You're not doing nothing. White supremacy is laughing at us right now. You could go in your, in your back and cook up a remedy and say, hey, drink this. It's good for heart disease. And we should just trust you willingly, just like that. Listen, trust is not a word I like to use with science. Because if somebody came to me and said, hey, I'm your dad, you're my dad, I'm going to take a DNA test by what the Europeans, their standards, and find out if it's my child. So saying the European is going to verify what's on CNN. I don't trust what it's because it's on CNN either. I have to do my own research, bro. That's all I'm saying. So you're saying we shouldn't do no research. Just believe you and Sirius B. You're going to really, as, as serious as a grown man, going to tell us, yo, let's trust me because I got my head wrapped up and I look like I know a little something, something. Come on, bro. And, and I did agree with you earlier that the diet is very important. So let me agree with you so you don't say that again. We have to do better Heart disease is the number one killer of black people. Um, diabetes is a killer. Cancer is a killer. Those things are related to your <laughs> diet. So I agree with you when it comes to diet, but I don't trust your way of giving us because I don't know you. I don't know what you're cooking in your backyard. I don't know. Because anybody could come up and say, hey, do this. You trust Sirius B because he's doing the same nonsense that you're doing. So you're going to trust him. But I'm going to tell you this. You remember Esoteric? I asked them, provide evidence that anybody came off in Jamaica, because you're in Jamaica now. you where my mom come from, Manchester, so I got nothing but love for you. All I'm saying is prove anybody came off a slave ship in Jamaica and said there was a Hebrew or an Israelite. Provide the source. And the same thing for mighty Hebrew. Show me anyone that came off a slave ship and said they were a Hebrew or an Israelite. And let me, I got one more. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to read this after he speaks. Cause I'm going to show him Bruce Haynes who came on my channel, African-American scholar on, he studied Hebrew Israelism and the root of it for his type of say, not one West. And I'm going to show you what he said when he, after you finish speaking. Thank you. I appreciate your scholarship on Garfield. Very excellent. One of the problems you constantly are having is nowhere did Dr. Benzie they tell you just to believe in him. Furthermore, Dr. Ben Zedek has been a role fate in African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem for many years, and we have results of the healing element. But let's get to the point as to what you were saying. Um, you said about, I said that the book, The Black Jews of Africa, was a good book. Sure, it's a good book, but that don't mean I agree with everything in the book. Second, you keep bringing up um, quotations from European scholars defining the Jews from North Africa coming into Tum, um, and it's around the sixth century B, um, AD, they were white. The problem with that is white in many of these old writings is defining illumination and not necessarily the skin color. Like if you come to Tanzania right now, the Tanzania natives call us white because of our, because of our complexion. And not necessarily, and you could be dark and they still call you white. Not because of, uh, 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 you know, we coming from Europe or anywhere like that or America, but they define us as light or white, actually white, based on our illumination. But I want to read something to you, right? Eyewitness account out of this book called Black Song, The Forge and the Flame, written by Dr. John Lavelle Jr. Page 31 and 32. This Afrocentric scholar says, if the African, excuse me, if the American white man fancies that he was the first to teach the Bible to his black slave, he is quite mistaken. 
Mungu Park, as affirmed by Marlon L. Stokely, found that Kentuma, the Catholic schoolmaster, had Arabic versions of the Pentateuch, because at that time, Arabic was the language of diplomacy between the 5th century ACE and the 15th century ACE. Let's continue on. The Psalms of David, the book of Isaiah. No, no, let me, yeah, he had, excuse me, let me go back up. Catholic schoolmaster had Arabic versions of the Pentateuch, the Psalms of David in the book of Isaiah. The unlearned Mandinkas entertained him with stories of Joseph and his brother, Moses, David, and Solomon. They gave out the story as part of their own folklore and were very much surprised to learn that white men had heard of them. If many slaves already knew a great deal of the Bible, the whole pattern of the origin and development of the backgrounds of the spiritual in America will have to be reconsidered. Also, you told me to go to some people around 700 ACE to see if we have um, sources of that. Well, I do. So let me give you the sources real quick and read the quotations because you said, oh, show you any sources, right? So Sorry. here right here, I come to the next round because I got it right here. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. Okay. All right. Um, are you ready, my brother? All right. So you already started for me. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. This is from Bruce Haynes. Okay. He's an African American and he studied the groups that this guy is affiliated with. The majority of Africans in North America were brought from West African societies which regularly practice ritual circumcision, the ritual slaughter of animals, and the separation of women during menstruation. These so-called Hebrewisms invoked by Black Hebrew groups such as the Harlem-based Commandment Keepers and other Judaizing Africans and African Americans have been frequently dismissed as inauthentic cults. <laughs> oh man, this is from my brother right here, Dr. Bruce D. Haynes, Jews of African descent in America. The first modern day black African or Negro to undergo a formal conversion to Judaism was discovered in the record of the Inquisition of 1474. Isn't that something? Why do they need to record when black people was converted to their religion? Why, if they are already black? Why would they need to do that? Let me show you another example of something else. And, and by the way too, again, he can show no source of anybody coming off a slave ship. Neither him or the fake doctor above me can show any damn body coming off a slave ship saying that they are Hebrew, Israelite, or Jew. They can't show it. They always called Negroes. That's all they were known as. Now this, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is a primary source. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Jews were forced to wear badges to distinguish themselves from Christians. If Jews were black, there would be no need for them to be distinguished. Jews, a study of race and environment. Right here. This is a primary source. Guess which one is the Jew esoteric? Not this guy in the middle, but the guy that's holding them. These guys are done. They are perpetrating a fraud. This is why nobody respects them in the world. They go to Demona, and you don't want me to go into Demona, because I know that history very well. This man said, and I have it on record, that he don't want to be a part of black power. So for this Dr. Ben guy to be a party with Demona and mighty Hebrew, why they don't tell you about Ben, ben Israel or whatever his name is in 1960s when he said, I don't want to be a part of black power. And he went to Liberia or wherever and was selling ice cream. He didn't want to be a part of black power. So, so for you now to come now in 2022 in, 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 in lineage of this guy who was fake from the jump while well, he's the Messiah and all that crap, how are you going to tell me about how black people need to have diet? You can't tell me nothing because the, the guy that created the Mona ran away from the black power movement. But he wanted to be an Israelite and, and live a fake identity. Look at, look at, look at mighty Hebrew. He in Tanzania, he's free now, but he's still living a fake identity. You can, none of you, both of you guys can't prove you're Israelite. You don't get a total book. You're not Israelite. Next. Sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Dr. My turn? Daisy. Yeah, it's your turn, man. <laughs> All right. 
first thing, I want to ask a quick question before, and then to Garfield. Who is Asari Motep to you? And how, and how do you respect, how well do you respect his scholarship? Yo, do your time, bro. No, I just asked your question, bro. That might be the only thing I'm asking you, my brother. Come on, who's Asari Motep? Your time how well do you respect brother. his scholarship? I'll, I'll answer when it's my turn, my brother. All right. Asari Motep, I'm just trying to find a video to put up. Asari Motep in one of his presentations said that the Yoruba and the ancient Hebrew came from the same speech community in the Sahara. Now, the, there's a thing in science, or what they call in science known as deductive and inductive thinking. Inductive thinking or spatial awareness, you look for patterns. Right? Asari, you look for patterns. And once you begin to see certain patterns with certain things, there's, there's, there's a level of, connect, there's a connection. There have to be some level of connectivity over a period of time for you to have those kind of um, connection. Right? Now, Asar Imhotep used that same reasoning in showing you the connection between the Yoruba language and the, the Hebrew language. Now, Hebrew is also defined as by European as an Afro-Asiatic language, right? I'm gonna stick to the, Afri the African aspect of it. So I'm gonna use the language and show you something here. The Yoruba have a term known as Ashe. The Hebrew have a term known as Asa and they both carry the same meaning. The name Moses is actually coming from the root, the same root as Ashe, and it means a master doer, a master alchemist, right? So you find the same concept in Hebrew and you find it in Yoruba, but not just those two languages, you find it in other languages in West Africa. And these are one of the ways you, you demonstrate what you call what um, one of the author, one of the linguists that um, Asari Motep quote, GJK William Dunn, right? He demonstrate the linguistic, the genetic relatedness between um, certain European language and no, not, not European language, between a number of languages in West Africa, right? So Asar used that same premise to show you the genetic relatedness between Yoruba and Hebrew, which means then Hebrew is not a European language. If you're gonna say Hebrews are European, then the language have to fit where they're time, from. Time. There you go. Um, you, re you ready for me, my brother? What you? Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I don't know why you would use a sorry motif um, like you're using them against me, <laughs> because, again, it doesn't matter who it is. I still have to look into it. He's made I've, I actually respect Asar, but that doesn't mean because me and him is cool. I have to agree with him 100 percent. I Again, I'm very cool with him. I could pick him up on the phone now and call him and put him on the live with us right now. The issue is I have to look into that. I'm not taking it at face value. Is there something wrong with that? I'll just review what my brother said. Now look at this right here. The Negro type among Jews is yet to be mentioned. One occasionally meets with a Jew whose skin is very dark, the hair black and woolly, right? This is from Morris Fishberg's book. I want you to take a look at what it says at the bottom. This is the Sephardic Jews from Spain with their dark Negro features, black hair and thick lips. The Jews, a study of the race. Look at what it says here. Galician Jews, the Negro types. Does this look like us? This is what they're classifying as Negro Jews. So when we read the stuff in the, in the research, you got to ask yourself what it is. Now, this is the crossing of the Dura Europus, AD 244 AD, 3rd century AD, swarthy Jews with brown skin, right? Now look at that another page at Dura Europus. Does that look like us? The scene of Moses rescued from the river. It don't look like us, but everybody's supposed to believe all Jews are black. And by the way, I'm not a color guy. I don't care if they're white or black. It's not us. It's simply not us. 
what we're doing again is perpetrating a fraud to try to fit ourselves into an identity that don't belong to us. It don't belong to us. And I'm saying that Dr. Ben Tezedek, is a fraud. I'm saying mighty Hebrew is a fraud. You guys are not Hebrews. You're not Israelites. You're perpetrating a fraud on black people. Whether you're in Africa, whether you want to pretend to be in Israel, whether you're in Jamaica, you're all frauds. And that's just the bottom line. You can't, you can't prove you are an Israelite. And you could go to the Bible. We could show anybody in the world that's despised and rejected. And the reason why black people, including my brother Esoteric, is going to feel despised and rejected is because of the fake curse of Ham that comes from that filthy book that you're trying to push on our people. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here right now because of that curse of Ham. We were brought over as slaves because they were justified because we come from Ham and we curse. So get the F out of here with that BS book. I don't care how much science you want to talk. I don't trust nothing out of your mouth. You are the, pro you are the problem, not me. You are the serious problem pushing this doctrine on us, trying to let us feed into your, your politician mindset like a Jim Jones. Oh, follow me because I have the truth. I have the science. You don't have jack shit. I'm out, man. I'm done. This, sick of this you know this. Thank you, Garfield. That was, that was a beautiful presentation from you. Notice how we didn't insult you or nothing, but let's get straight to the point. If you notice, every time you hear us speak and when we're done, notice you keep saying, well, I have to research that. Notice you keep saying that. My mother always say, never bring a knife to a gunfight. You're not rebuttaling anything we're saying, but we're rebuttaling you. Like for instance, if you go to the African Edenic diaspora from Dr. Shar um, Amadi al Ben Yahuda, he says, historically, it is known that a majority of African Edenic peoples who live in the Americas descended from the ancient African Edenic Hebrews who migrated after 70 AD across Africa, Eden, over a thousand year period ending up on the West Coast of Africa. Many modern tribes of West Africa have been documented to practice Hebrew Israelite customs, thus verifying the presence. The great European slave trade that brought many African Edenic peoples to the Americas had its beginnings and concentration in West Africa. There are an untold number of black African Hebrews scattered throughout the United States. Let's stop right there. So he makes quotations basically that don't have anything that we're saying or have anything to do with what we're saying. So thus far, we use all Afrocentric scouts. We use Dr. Ben, we use Sheikh Antidia, we use Dr. John Henry Clark, we use Asar M. Hotep, who I listen continuously where he says that Hebrew is an Afro-Asiatic language. Basically, he says an African language that goes back into the Sahara. We're using all black scholars. And then you juxtapose because Sirius B was on black magic. They had to be, he has to be pseudo. These are your arguments. You clearly said that you basically don't know anything that we're talking about and that you have to research these things. Another thing, you bring up a book that is defining, doc, uh, not doctor, but Rabbi Wentworth A. Matthews from out of commandment keepers. You haven't shown anything with this man said about Ben Israel. Ben Israel, what you mean? Adonai Rabbi Nu Ben Ami Ben Yisrael? That's who you're talking about? Show us a quote where he said that. You're saying he ran. He was with all the major prominent leaders, him and Prince Asiel, bringing Dr. Khalid Muhammad. He said that we were Hebrews. Farrakhan, he said that we were Hebrews. Um, you got quotations from um, Malcolm X saying it, all these different, Elijah Muhammad, all these different people saying these things, but you saying it's false. Also, you said, oh, you can't show no quotations of us being in West Africa. Well, let's go to the city of Lam Lam. Since you saying that, and these people were recognized and identified as black people. And also you brought up the Sephardic Jews being called Negro Jews. Yeah, naturally, you're going to have variations of Israelites miscalled Jews. The only true Jews are from the tribe of Judah. So that's Bill on Lam Lam. You yes, um, one of the sources that I wanted to use was the kingdom of Lam Lam going back to the 12th century ACE. It was a Hebrew kingdom 200 miles east of Timbuktu. And my source is Al Ezraus. As, and some people pronounce it Ezra. They can go there to that source who was actually an eyewitness of that African Hebrew kingdom. Thank you. Okay, Garfield. Yeah, we got to be careful with the lamb lamb because when Rudolph Windsor um, 
talked about the lamb lamb. He actually, I don't know if you guys respect Rudolph Windsor 100% or how y'all look at it, but he actually said the lamb lamb was a set of white tribes. And that's what he said in his book, um, Babylon of Timbuktu, just for the record. All right, so y'all could go to Babylon of Timbuktu. And I actually have an article. We gotta be careful also with the Arabic sources because the Arabic sources, right? How they look at their sources, they'll have a source from the ninth century. And the person would be with the same neighborhood where the lamb lamb was. And then they'll have a source to 10th century where the same place the lamb lamb was and they'll use a different name. So the lamb lamb, you know, people are saying that they, they use the word Jews. So there's a little controversy going on. I don't speak Arabic. I don't, I don't know it, but I have the actual book by John Hunwick or by um, Lemsin, Nehemiah Letspin or whatever his name is. And he actually breaks down what the lamb lamb actually is. And it goes back to another source. So he, um, I think brother um, Mighty Hebrew was talking about Idrisi. That's what he was talking about, Mighty Hebrew, Idrisi. So I think Idrisi used somebody else. And they're saying that yeah. the source that he used actually never said that. And they said it's something else. So the whole Lamlan thing is a big controversy. But, but at the end of the day, we got to be careful with these Arabic sources and how we look at them. All right. But um, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Whenever you think about Jews in West Africa, it's well documented. We have a lot of documentation of Jews in West Africa. We have a Timbuktu. I have this book about Jews under Islam where it talks about the trade and it gives the names of the family members and everything. So when we look at Jews in West Africa, it's documented. My only problem is, as I told uh, Mighty Hebrew earlier, is that we are stuck because the Jews that are documented are actually sometimes helping with the actual slave trade. So we're in a bind now. So if there are Jews in West Africa and they're taking on slave ships, as I said, when he was recording, my brother, did they have something called divine amnesia? Did they forget? Because we see them coming on, following practices of the Akan, the Asante, the Igbo, in Jamaica, you have Uno, you have um, certain dialects. There's a guy um, in Jamaica that was, and I think he's, he passed recently, that was speaking like an original dialect that's connected to the Twi language as far as linguistics is concerned. So we do have a connection with the continent of Africa. I would never debate that. But saying that those people who are in the, um, the Asante, that they are Jews, I, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. But I do think Jews were in West Africa, but they actually slept with African women and had children. And those children helped our um, Luso Africans who helped with the actual slave trade. And that's what they did. Okay. Dr. So ben. Dr. Ben, today. Yeah, sorry I got cut off earlier. Now, again, we know that the term Jew is coming from the word Judah. The 12 tribe of Israel would necessarily be classified as, or, or what is called as Jew. So we can't just put out a blanket statement as Jews in West Africa. That's one. We also know that you have the Ga'adangbe, and a lot of them came to Jamaica. You may ask me how I know. You can look at word retention, and you will see like Bombokla, Bohukla is Ga'adangbe. And so many other words we use in Jamaica is Gadangbe. Yofene, Ofane. My mother would say Yofene, Ofane, like it's a term of endearment. That's Gadangbe. But you find Bohukla, Ofane, you find all those words in Hebrew. I can show it to you. But the Gadangbe have a migration story coming from Northeast Africa. What is called Israel. Uh, those regions, Ethiopia, etc. So they're telling their story. So um, they're telling their story. The, the other thing now, you even mentioned terms like Unu. Unu is, is Igbo, and it corresponds to the Hebrew word Anu or Anachnu, and it means us or you all. It's plural. So when you look at genetic relatedness, you find a lot of terms used in West Africa, you find it within the Hebrew language. So that is showing you that there is some level of genetic relatedness, but not just that, the word bear the same meaning. 
For instance, you have the word when in Akan, when you're greeted, they say Akwamba. The ba means to come or go. In Igbo, when you say, where were you? You say, me bina, me, be, me bina Kingston. The bear is coming from ba, right? You find the same word in Hebrew. If I'm calling you as a masculine person in Hebrew, I would say, bo, Garfield. If it's female, I say, boi. But it's all coming from the one root, ba. And the Igbo, the Akan, they all have that ba root and other Bantu and other what they call, notice what I said, what they call Bantu languages. So you see the, we see the, the, the relatedness relative to the language, the genetic relatedness relative to the language. But we see that the words carry the same meaning on a day-to-day -day level, but also on an esoteric level. The next, my next, when next portion when I come in, I will mention the concept of obia and show you obia in the Torah, in the Tanakh, practiced by the Hebrew. But I will, I will show you the difference. There is a difference. Yeah, let me um, say this real quickly regarding the. Um, I brought up my notes on my phone, but it's not clear. It's thinking about the um the lam lam real quickly. Um, Nayamiam is undoubtedly a variant of Narmam, which together with such terms as lam lam, dam dam, Amina, and Barbara, appears in the 14th, the works of the medieval Arab geograph geographers from the 11th to the 14th centuries. The dam dam, according to Al Baka, are the people who eat anyone who falls into their hands. On the land, uh, describe how the people of Ghana make raids on the land of the Barbara and the Amina and capture their people. The Amina follow the religion of the Majus. That's according to Al Idrisi um, 1154. So they were actually saying the Lam Lam were, depending on which author is, is saying that they were cannibalistic people. But in another area, the Arab people call them Jews. So now when they call them Jews per se, or whatever word they use, remember that the Arabs don't like Christians or Jews. So they might call some people in the writings Jews or Christians because they don't like them. So we've got to be careful with the Arabic writing. As far as the linguistic stuff with Uno and, um, and so forth, I'm very familiar with that. And um, there's a YouTube channel that I actually watch a lot about the, the linguistic connections with um, there's some serious scholarship in Jamaica on the linguistic connection. Nobody doubts that at all. As far as the Hebrew part, I don't I have no idea. I've heard a lot of claims. The Gadangmi people are in Jamaica also, and the, um, the Mende people from, from Angola, because that's actually in my genetic makeup, in my DNA. Um, well, when it comes to being a Hebrew, there's a, there's a lot of words that people use, and I've seen a lot of information on it. And it seems like you might find a chance of a word, but I, I'm not seeing a regular connection. Just like how we would say mother, father, son, brother, sister, some basic terminology. You know, when you're doing a cross comparative linguistic analysis, you know, you, you try to match up words and see if they fit. I would love to, for um, Ben to do that and see what we could come up with. Then we could talk about relationship with words. But you do have words in culture because, of course, Jews are there. So you're going to find words that yeah, don't make the, the Akan and the Igbo and the, the, um, the Gadangmi people. They, have, they do have a tradition, but there's an there's a, um, African study, my brother, about the Akan people. And the Akan people included, you know, the Asante, the Fond, whatever. And they actually use their actual oral tradition, use anthropology and archaeology, and some of their oral tradition actually agrees with science. So yeah, some Africans who are actually doing that work to trace storylines. So that's a study I think a lot of people need to get into. That was definitely um, some good um, information that you just brought forth, Garfield. Um, I'm gonna let the linguistic part go ahead with Bain Z Day. Um, you mentioned from Babylon to Timbuktu by Professor Rudolf R. Yahuda Windsor, who's actually, a, his brother Cole Windsor was a personal teacher of mine. Um, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, when you actually look at Babylon, the Timbuktu, it was a book dealing with comparative study. 
And you brought up Babylon the Ten Buck too, saying that Professor Rudolph R. Windsor said that the people of Lamla were white. That's not what he said from Babylon the Ten Buck too. What he did was make a quotation where certain scholars tried to say they were white, but in fact, they were really black people. Um, to bring up the cannibalism part, that's either here or there. Many African tribes fell into a form of savagery and dealt with form of cannibalistic ways and art. When you actually look at Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, it said we would eat our own children. So in that retrospect, if there were that, then that's what it was at that time. It could have been for many different reasons. It could have been starvation, whatever the case may be. But the point, Lam Lam did exist. It did exist because we can go on the ground and them areas, we still have Hebrews there. But let me just read something to you real fast. I want to read out of a book from Mary Benson called Nelson Mandela, The Man in the Movement, page 17. At home, Nelson Mandela, as a child, heard a more recent event not taught in history lessons of how in 1921, General Smuts, the prime minister, had sent an army which massacred 163 men, women, and children at nearby Barnhart in the Eastern Cape, members of an Israelite sect, they had refused to move from the common ground on which they were camping. Also to back that up, we can go into Robert Egger's book because they chose the plan of God on page one. On May 24th, 1921, a force of 800 white policemen and army troops gathered at the place called Barnhart, five kilometers southwest of Queenstown of the Eastern Cape. The government had instructed them to confront an African prophet, Enoch Gojuma, and his religious group called the Israelites. And they were Old Testament, by the way. When the battle was over, nearly 200 Israelites lay dead and many others wounded. We know this battle as the Boar Heart Massacre. The thing that I'm saying, Garfield, is we can go on the ground and we can see Israelites all throughout Africa. Um, you did admit now your theses have changed that there were African Hebrews, um, you may, you didn't say they were black, they were white, but they were people of color. All I'm saying is that we have Dr. Ben, we have Dr. John Henry Clark, we have Sheikh Antti Diop, we have Prince Asia, we just have all these scholars that say we even on the ground and we're seeing these things. So if we can acknowledge that the icon people came on boats and others, then it could be possible that there were some Hebrews that came. And remember the old saying, Africans sold Africans, okay? So let's say if we did have some Hebrews that were a part of the transatlantic slave trade, there were many African Sorry. tribes that, thank you. Yeah, with the, um, let me just clear up the lamb lamb. The issue with the lamb lamb, let me just repeat what it's basically saying. The issue is not if lamb lamb were Jews, and you have to go back to the, the folks who actually translated it. What they're trying to tell us, all right, just to, just to be on the up and up, um, the book is Islam in West Africa, Religion, Society, and Politics, 1800 by Nehemiah Levitson. The gentleman that actually translated this stuff was, um, wow, I forgot what his name is, but he's the one that translated all the stuff into English. But what they're saying is that it just it doesn't mean Jews as far as Jews. That's what they write in the English that we see. It appears in the works of Arab geographers from the 11th to the 14th centuries. So the word lam lam is used or dam dam or amima. Amima is A-M-I-M-A -M -A, and the word barbara. So they use that word, though all those words interchangeable. So al baka who wrote it originally first in the 11th century, he said, those people, the people who eat anyone to fall into their hands. It, he describes how the people of Ghana would make raids on the land of the Barbara and the Amima and capture their people. The Amima followed the religion of the Majors. Al Idrisi now in the 12th century, called those people Lam Lam, the people of Barisa, Sila, and Ghana and make forays into the land of Lam Lam and capture its inhabitants. Now watch this now. They bring them to their own, this is the part that a lot of people like, they bring them to their own country and sell them to the visiting merchants. Now this is not during the slave trade. This is way, way before. I don't know what they did with them or where they did, but the Muslim kingdoms of the Sahel and the uncivilized allegedly cannibalistic inhabitants of the interior on account of their paganism. And that's by Al-Zahuri. 
No one enters your country and no merchandise is imported, imported into it. Now, as far as African scholars saying certain things, again, African scholars, again, are using other people's works. And those people's works, we can't act like because Ben Amin or Dr. Ben or Dr. Clark use it, that means it's right and exact. What we need to find out is who they're using. And of course, they're using the Arabic sources because I think um, Dr. Clark mentions this a lot. So I, there, again, it's not us. It's the Arabic scholars who are writing about these people. And they're writing about them. They're basically saying they're not Jews. They are whoever they are. But they're trying to classify them in that because of their dislike for Jews. You know, that's basically what the scholarship is saying. But as far as um, when our scholars say anything, I don't take anything at face value, family. I have to research it and weigh the evidence from all sides and look at it. Because every culture nowadays, especially in Africa, is claiming that they come from Israel. Almost every culture. So you're going to find communities springing up all over. Okay, Dr. Ben, when okay. you, as part of your three minutes, I'm going to add on another two minutes for you to give your closing uh, remarks, okay? Okay. So we, we're looking at cultural um, similarities here. So we see in Ghana, you have the term Obia. And we see in, um, I believe it's second Samuel's, I think it's six or 16, where Saul visit the Ob, the Baal Ob, to channel the spirit of Samuel. And that word there, Ob, it, it, it means bottle in the sense of, you got to see within a cultural context, it, it, in the sense of channeling or capturing a spirit. And, but it also, yes, it's also dealing with channeling an entity. So that word ob come from the word bat, which means to come or to enter. And that same word, the root word ba formed the word nabia, which means prophet. So on one hand, you have a ob, one who knows that the sonic keys are the means to channel a particular entity, to communicate or get certain information or use them to do carry out certain functions. And then on the other hand, you have a nabia. And a nabia is one according to within the Hebraic tradition. A nabia, the most I said, I reveal my secrets to my servants. The key here word here is the servant. That means there have to be a particular lifestyle that comes with that. I reveal my servants to my, my nabia, the, the, the prophets, the nabia. So no, the, the difference is one is a one have a particular moral obligation. I ain't define what that yet is. What I know here in Jamaica, a lot of those who practice obia, and I'm not saying it's bad. What well, a lot of times you can they can be paid off to do certain things, right? And to cause harmful things to happen to people. So in that sense, it has a negative stigma. But when you learn the true root of the word in Ghana, it really means one who knows the ways and mannerisms, the mechanisms to, to connect to certain forces. But that same word, bia, obia, is come from bia. It really means the mitochondria DNA because it is the means by which you connect to the earth, psychic channels, to tap into the mycelium network work to connect with these forces. So you find the same word bia as the in as a as a, a, a child root of ba and it makes up the word nabia also. So I'm not shedding a negative light on it, but one have to go deeper into the etymological root of it to understand the difference in function. Are you there? Yeah. Yes, we're here. You, you, you've got another two minutes in order to close out. I got another two minutes? Okay. So I'm going to quote a little bit from this book, the Okra Complex on Akan Cosmology. And the term Bia, 
in Ghana is interchangeable with the word ba, which also exists in the Hebrew, means to come. Bere and wa. Bere or ba means is a term used for gender specification relative to female. It also means mannerism, ways, and place. There is a cosmological reason why the term bi is used in a feminine context because it precisely it is in reference to the mitochondria DNA, which is only passed from mother to child. Earth directly communicate with woman directly on the psychic channel by way of the mitochondria DNA. The um, providing uh, by the mitochondria DNA. All right. So just to go a little bit shed some more understanding on the mitochondria. It is the mitochondria DNA that powers embryonic genesis and new melanin production relative to the development of neurotoxic highway that results in the production of cells, tissue, organs, and a fully developed child. And also endow that child with eumelanin melanosome, which is brown. And this brown to black eumelanin endow us, you melanin people, to connect with the full light spectrum in order to receive um, revelations, rece receive, interpret, and transmit revelation, right? So the Akan system is showing us that those who practice Obia, it is by way of the, the, the mitochondria that they have. It is a word that is dealing specifically with the mitochondria DNA and how it functions. And it's the same thing with one who is called a Nabia, a prophet. The difference is the mannerisms. What is the objective? Are you enhancing, liberating, doing the works of the Most High, or are you seeking to harm or control people contrary to their nature? Dr. Ben. So we find both terms bearing the same me? meaning within the that's, Akan that's cosmology that's and what is called the Hebrew ben. cosmology, which to me, it's, it's, it seems one in the same. Yeah, I hear you. Thank yeah, you. that's your time, Dr. Ben. No problem. Garfield, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, he said, um, he said a lot. <laughs> we got to be careful. Um, whenever we talk about linguistics. As I said before, I would love to see his cross comparative linguistic analysis. So I could actually look at it because I pretty much know what is required to make that decision. I was actually taught that by a star Imhotep. So we could look at what the comparisons are with five basic words. And if you see there's a um, connection here, you could say, hey, the language is connected. But if we find words that are similar, and we throw them out, ba and bia, i a h, and whatever. It it there is a chance of words coming into a language. There is there is a way that if someone is communicating, like for example, the Bible is full and loaded with emetic loan words, and also in Kemet, there's over five hundred loan words that they have found within the New Kingdom era. So loan words are possible. But to say they are connected because we are those people, I don't see that. There, there is a connection where you could form a, a genetic connection with the actual text. As far as words is concerned, you can have a genetic connection. But as, what about our genetics though? Our DNA, our mitochondrial and our Y DNA. It actually could tell us where we're from and from different areas. It just so happens esoteric that the DNA is saying that these people have been in West Africa for over eight to 10,000 years. So our genetic markers were actually, it was mutated in West Africa. So that's a way how we could tell if we're actually Israel or not. Another way is um, sickle cell. The sickle cell trait originated 7,000 years ago in West and Central Africa. And guess what? Those people migrated all over the world. Everywhere where there's sickle cell, it actually originates from the ben, Benin haplotype or the Cameroon haplotype. And what happened is in Jamaica, 10% of every Jamaican right now have sickle cell. 
10% of every African American have sickle cell. 10% of every black person in the UK have sickle cell trait, not sickle cell, sickle cell trait. So that is a marker showing where the people come from. If you go to Brazil, where the most of the slaves went, they have the sickle cell trait at 10% too. And what happened is, say for example, my first son, I have the trait and his mom have the trait. They tell us when we're growing up in Jamaica, what? We're not supposed to have children together. And guess what? My son doesn't have it. So he's like an anomaly because two people who parents who have it normally pass it on to the child. And guess what? So the reason why there's everywhere the slaves went, there's a sickle cell trait going on. So we could trace where we come from based on the sickle cell trait. And guess what? Sickle cell trait is in Egypt. It's in Italy, it's in Greece. But when you look at those areas, they have the African Benin haplotype. They travel all the way, Africans travel all the way and mix with those people because it's the same haplotype from at least 7,000 years ago. They say it could go up to 19,000 years ago. And guess what? Guess what's the dagger in all of this? They all come from people with E1B1A. So that's telling me Western Central Africans are Western Central Africans. They have nothing to do with Israel. And this is what science does. It carried the marker of the sickle cell as a way of telling us, wherever you see these people with this sickle cell trait, and the people might say, I don't have a sickle cell. Of course, like my son, but his parents had it. He don't have it. He luckily, he got locked up. So we know who we are now. Did the people who practice the Israelite tradition mix with Africans? Yes. But what we are are West and Central African. A sickle cell trait is, is the key to understanding. This is why I know that we're not from Kemet either. This is why I know we're not from Ethiopia either, so-called Ethiopia today. This is why I know that. So we can we can parlay and, and, and put, you see, the, you see what's key is, Ben has the linguistics. I have history, I have archeology, span but I also have genetic information. We have E1B1A and we have sickle cell trait. Now, a lot of these guys who come out with, with, with genetic markers, they say, well, Dr. So-and-so came out and said that the E1B1A is Shem and E1B1B is Ham or the other way around or vice versa. No, E1B1A, according to science, has been around for over 40,000 years. How much time I got left, my brother? I didn't see that a while ago. Oh, I'm done? All right, thanks. So, uh, Prince Charlene Ding, would you like to close out? Hey, I got to yes. jump off, beloved. Beloved, I got to jump off. Okay. That's a Terry, you heard me? I heard you. I heard yeah, I got to jump off. Peace of love. Hey, again. That was a good, um, that was definitely a good presentation that you brought forth, Garfield. Uh, one of the things I want to deal with the E1B1A is I have something here where I broke down the origins of the Natufians and I break down the post diluvian E1B1 um, origins of the Natufians, right? And this is what I say in my writing to 311 trillion, 40 billion BC to now. I said, just like I've been saying, the Edenic post diluvian E1B1, Natufian, Atlantean, Aryans, or the noble ones originated in ancient Israel, northeastern Africa. The Edenic post-Diluvian E1B1 Natufians of 13,500 BCE were born, by the way, of the Edenic Tamal Diluvians, excuse me, Naduvians, or the Ramalhus who originated from what is known today as Madagascar, which was part of Tamal Nadu, that were a group of Elohim that incarnated in bodily form. That's another um, topic, but I want y'all to hear this. The Lachish um, excavation has already scientifically confirmed that the ancient Israelites were Y-DNA hypno group E3 and E1B1A. And I want to show a picture of these Israelites from 680 BCE during the Assyrian captivity. As you can clearly see, these are African people. This is, this is mm -hmm. statue. There's no way of getting around this. Um, you can see the kinky hair, the kinky beard, everything. Congo, Let's go even deeper. Let's go even deeper. Since you say you're an archeologist, 
So we have kinky hair Israelites right here. There's no way of getting around this. This was during the Babylonian exile. Us going into the Babylonian captivity. There is no way you can get around this. Also, to give a quotation, I would like to go to Dr. George G. Cameroon of the Department of Oriental Studies at the University of Chicago, who informs us in his book, History of Early Iran, that the original population of this era, area was in fact Proto-Negro. The word Proto means early. So Proto-Negro would mean early or ancient Black people. Notice throughout this whole demonstration, I've quoted scholar upon scholar upon scholar. And I mean, these are Afrocentric scholars and, and along with European scholars. Um, let's continue on. I want to show you something else. I would like to go to Prince Dr. Shaliat bin Yahuda lecture during the September 1993 sacred visitation pilgrimage tour of the Northeastern African region, Israel to Egypt. It says the original Hamitic Egyptians and Sudanese, all black cultures were driven and carried away from their own lands and replaced with transplants from the Northern European areas. This helps one to comprehend the removal of the Israelites from what are now termed the Middle or Near East regions of Northeastern Africa. I mean, these are scholars upon scholars that are on the ground. There's a difference from academic consensus and with this scholar said versus that scholar versus people literally on the ground doing the research, doing the research of these people in these same areas where he talked about Lam Lam. Well, we can go to Senegal today and these people are still there practicing the Hebrew culture. How do we uh, um, bypass the same areas that they saying Hebrews were at in West Africa, still there today, and they're black. They're black. Garfield admitted out of his mouth, he's not saying that the original Hebrews were black. He's not admitting it, that they were white. Then he tries to quote where it says the word white in these old in these old contemporary records of the 19th century, not understanding white only defined the illumination of quote unquote black skin. If you come to Tanzania right now, esoteric thoughts, they will call you, they will say, you're a white man because of your radiance that come from your brown skin. Anybody that knows about East Africa, West Africa, they call people of the melanated hue complexion of African Americans and West Indians as being white, but they don't mean white like a white man. So let's make that clear. Also, I would like to go to the Kubuko and the Songo, who are in present day Angola, and they out of their own mouths teach, here is a picture of them. They teach that they're direct descendants of the Israelites, right? And these are drawings from the 1800s. These are the actual pictures of them. Here goes some better pictures, two of them. Look, y'all. These are Israelites from West Africa. Can you see um, esoteric thoughts? How many more mm -hmm. minutes do I have now? How many more minutes do I have esoteric thoughts? Time's up, but I'll let you finish off. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is just to close out. If anybody sit back and listen to this whole discussion, Garfield, a brilliant scholar, he pointed out maps and he spoke about Roman incursion, but he never showed in any of the writings of Israelites migrating to West Africa, Europe, anything. He just brought up the Sahara Desert and how it would be impossible to migrate. But we do have my, migrational records of the areas where we're saying that these Hebrews are at and even the scholarship records that he's reading that they're there today. Also, every time we brought up in the presentation scholars, he clearly said that that information, I don't know nothing about it, it's pseudo, I would have to research it. So everything we brought up, he didn't rebuttal anything, but everything that I brought up, I rebuttal on him. He said white scholars say they're white, but he just admitted that he now knows that they're not white. So if you saying that Garfield, then why would you bring it up to prove a stance because subjectively you think that the Israelites are white, 
by using these words like Jew and Jewish when we know the only true Jews are from the tribe of Yehuda or Judah, which they were black too. Then you try to bring up Hebrews having a participation in selling off slaves. Well, they just made the woman movie The Woman King, which is not 100% accurate, but they show different African tribes, so-called African tribes, enslaving other Africans and selling them to Europeans. Then you bring up the cannibalism as if to disdain them for being Hebrews. That's not proving anything. That's actually agreeing with Deuteronomy 28 because it said when we would go into these nations, we would even eat the own feces of our, our fetuses of our children. Then Look at everything, how you're, you're confirming what we're seeing. Then we, and I put the parameters down. I clearly said, we do not subscribe to the belief that all the slaves that came over were Hebrews. Did I not say that? I clearly said that you had other African tribes that also came into slavery. So you mean to tell me all these millions of slaves that came over and you know that there are communities in Africa that exist today, that even if you want to say that it was created in the 11th century, 12th century, is it possible that there were some Hebrews that came on them slave ships? Then you say, well, show me any Hebrew that came off the boat calling themselves Hebrew. How could I show you that when we were forbidden to even read or write in that language when we first came off the boat? There's no records of them saying they're Yoruba, they are kind, they're not saying any of that. Why? That's in disingenuous scholarship. But I thank you, Esoteric Thoughts, for having us on the show. And we will come back for part two. Shout out to Garfield Reed. Shout out to Dr. Ben Shadi. Shalom Aleikum. Thank you, Jet.